of the Lord came to Elijah, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. God said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram. Also you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, of Abel-Meholah, as prophet in your place. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, this is 1 Kings 19. And I actually did this as part of a youth study a couple of months ago. But it's this place in which Elijah has come to the end of his ministry. He's worn out. He's tired. He is ready to be done. He's basically telling God, kill me now. Kill me now. I'm done. I've, I've, I've spent my energy. I have nothing else to give. Multiple times he gives the same answer. I've been very zealous for the Lord. And then he goes on to talk about the destruction of the altars and and the forsaking of the covenant and the killing of the prophets. And then God tells him to go stand on the side of a mountain, right? Most of us know the story. And God sends a whole bunch of stuff. He sends the, this this great wind that it was so strong that it was splitting mountains, basically a tornado or hurricane or, or something. And, and the word makes it very specific to say God was not in that. And then it sends an earthquake and says God was not in that. It sends a great fire and God was not in that. And then it's this sound of sheer silence, or some of our translations say still small voice. I, I like this NRSV translation. I think also it's the same in the Christian Standard Bible, that it's this, this sound of sheer silence. And at that point, it does not qualify it with, and the Lord or, or God was not in <laughs> That, that silence. So the assumption is made by the reader, the assumption is made by us, that God was in that silence. And then it, I, I love verse 13 here in, in chapter 19 of 1 Kings. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle. When Elijah heard it, can you hear silence? I think it's part of the reason why many of our translations say a still small voice, because it's this tiny little voice. In the distance, God's speaking a word in the distance, and yet here it says the sound of sheer silence. Does silence have a sound? Silence is basically the absence of sound, the absence of noise. And in some ways, this this picture of God coming and being present in the silence does a multiple number of things for Elijah and for us. It speaks to Elijah of the fact that that his, his assumption being that God was not present with him or present with Israel with all the horrible things that were taking place, the, the forsaking of the covenant, throwing down of the altars, uh, the killing of the prophets, seeing all of that as basically feeling abandoned by God. And then God is sitting here saying, now I'm present with you. Maybe just not in the way that you think. But then also, all of those things happening. All of these people speaking vile things against Elijah, wanting to kill him, wanting to get rid of him. And God comes to him in silence, eliminating the noise, eliminating the voices, eliminating the things that would cause him more fear. And instead, Elijah just hears the silence. Is able to rest from all that noise, rest from all those voices that tell him other things, so that God might speak to him. 
and that, that he might calm Elijah down because then God does speak to him, right? God asks him again, what are you doing here, Elijah? Why are you here? And Elijah then gives the same response. I've been zealous for the Lord, but everyone else is not. And then he goes on to say, I'm going to give you a job. <laughs> and your job is going to be a very interesting job. You're going to go and anoint the king of your enemies. And then you're going to go anoint another king in the place of Ahab, who is causing all this strife. And then you're going to anoint your successor. You're going to find the person who's going to take over for you so that you don't leave your mantle that you've covered your face with, that you've sheltered yourself with. You don't leave that empty, but you bring someone else in. And then the part I didn't read, it talks about how uh, whoever escapes the sword of Haziel, the punishment, Jehu shall kill, and whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall kill. That's kind of a, uh, I don't know if I like that. But then I like this, verse 18, Yet I, God is speaking, yet I, God, will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Saying that, that out of the hundreds of thousands of people in Israel, God is going to pick 7,000 people to keep the covenant and to hold on to him so that a remnant remains. That Elijah might know, okay, this isn't in vain, whatever work I am doing. And that's part of what God comes and does for us. God comes to us, especially at times when we are feeling the most spent. And he often comes in silence to offer us rest, a Sabbath, a, a way to remove us out of all the noise. But then also he might commission us Give us a job to do for him. And sometimes that job involves finding our replacement because maybe our time is up or, or maybe our time in one particular ministry or another is done. And so it's time to hand off that, that thing. That's maybe one of the struggles we've had in the church for, for the last few decades is that we don't have an apprenticeship program in which many of us do not go around trying to find the person that will replace us because we never think that we won't be able to do whatever ministry it is that God has given us, but God decides those things for us, right? And then to make sure to reassure us that God's work is the thing that is being done, not ours. That we happen to be the vessels. We be the ministers. We be the servants. We be the slaves of God. And yet God does his work such as, I will leave 7,000 in Israel all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Well, church, I hope that you have a blessed week this week, that you find some time for that rest, that you not try to find God in some amazing, huge, magnificent, gigantic thing, but that he might come to you even in silence, in Sabbath and rest, but that also he, in that silence, <laughs> he could be speaking to you calling to you, telling you of what it is that he's calling for you to do, but trusting that he will fulfill it because it is his work through you for his sake. Let us pray. Keep, we beseech thee, O Lord, thy church with thy perpetual mercy, and because the frailty of man without thee cannot but fall, keep us ever by thy help from all things hurtful, and lead us to all things profitable to our salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, church, go in peace. Serve the Lord. We will see you tomorrow.